Jimmy. Uh, I'm, I'm just really delighted to, to be here, um, and I'm sorry that it's such a hurried visit, but uh, I'm here uh, in the region uh, with my other hat on as the Vice President of the World Bank, and I, I didn't want to come to the region and not spend time uh, with you. Um, uh, first of all, to thank you uh, for <coughs> the work you do on a daily basis, uh, which is fundamental then to any of the work that any other development partner does. Uh, in the area of uh, forestry, agroforestry, uh, and agriculture. Um, I just spent the last few days in Rwanda and Burundi, in both occasions up on terraced hillsides, or uh, non-terraced hillsides, or uh, unproductive hillsides in some cases, looking at how we can intensify agriculture, raise the income of communities, protect uh, the forests and the watersheds, and put two small, extremely fertile countries, or parts of those countries, certainly very fertile, uh, onto a path to sustainability. Um, none of that work is really possible without everything that we learn from the work that you do. And so for that, I am very grateful. And I just uh, urge you to continue to hold your mission close to your heart and to work very hard. You have great leaders. And across the CGIR network, we have uh, a very dynamic set of director generals uh, and staff. And my job as the uh, fund council chair, which uh, I took over my position in the bank in September. I became the chair of the fund council in November. Um, the way I see my job is that uh, we as the donors uh, are trying to mobilize about a billion dollars uh, for agricultural research on a, on a repeated basis. Um, that was part of the reform effort that you launched two or three years ago the idea that we needed to make the whole be more than the sum of the parts. And so my job is to engage with the G8, with the G20, with all of the development partners to mobilize that, that funding. And at a time when food security is very much at the forefront of everybody's minds, make sure that the fundamental role agricultural research plays in the strategies for food security is not forgotten. Um, sometimes you know that uh, we're always looking for that silver bullet. We're looking for the next big thing. And we mustn't, at the same time, uh, defund or underfund uh, fundamental uh, research and its application, its ability to be applied into all areas of, uh, of agricultural development, uh, forest development, etc. cetera. Um, I met uh, Tony for the first time, although I did know him a little bit by reputation, um, in Durban at the at, uh, COP, uh, COP17, uh, the, the climate change uh, uh, convention negotiations. Um, and I was very struck uh, at that, uh, at that uh, COP, which was you know, supposed to be Africa's COP. It was <clears throat> another, con another convention meeting on African soil. It doesn't happen very often. Um, and we tried very hard on behalf of the World Bank, but with all of our partners, to put a focus onto the landscape, uh, the reality of uh, most uh, Africans' lives, even though the path of urbanization here is so, uh, is so rapid and so profound. Uh, we try to put the focus on agriculture, um, on agroforestry and forestry, as, as, and talk about landscape approaches to climate adaptation and to adaptation-based mitigation. So often in these climate conventions, the real focus so it tends to get sucked into a sort of carb, what I call a carbon fundamentalist debate. You know, are we, how are we going to mitigate carbon? You know, who's to blame and how are we going to do that? And we lose sight of the things that we need to be doing now, the, things we need, the people we need to be serving now by producing uh, adaptation-based mitigation methods. And so for us, you know, we, 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 together with many others, have coined the phrase climate smart agriculture. And what we mean by that is really the ability to lift incomes, uh, increase yield, and at the same time mitigate uh, emissions uh, on one landscape in an integrated way with people at the heart of that. I do not think that that is overly ambitious. In, think, in, in fact, I think it's absolutely fundamental. And for the, from the part of the World Bank Group, we see ourselves as the World Bank Group as primarily an adaptation institution. You know, primarily our work in development is about adaptation. Of course we have a role discussing at the political level and at the policy level what the strategies around 
decreasing emissions are, and we work with countries on low emissions development and paths towards greener growth. But if you look at the bulk of our portfolio, if you look at the bulk of what the World Bank Group is here to do, we are really, you know, I hope, the premier sort of adaptation institution uh, from a development perspective in the world. But in the, in the conversation at the COP in Durban, uh, where we did launch CRP6, uh, I was struck by how bifurcated our world is. Um, so the agricultural community is sitting and talking over here, and then the forestry community is sitting and talking over here. And then there's institutions like ICRAF and the World Bank sort of trying to hold the two conversations together. It's the same landscape. Um, and I, I, I was struck by that because I think that this is one of the challenges we face in CGIR overall. We have 15 centers with deep excellence, deep sector expertise, deep specific issue expertise. Some of those centers go back in their history well beyond the creation of CGIR. So I think what we're trying to do in the reform process, and what's terribly important for me representing the funders and talking to the donors on a weekly basis, is that we need to leverage more resources into agricultural research. We need to leverage more resources into your hands. But the quid pro quo, I think, is that we need to be able to demonstrate that we are not only able to preserve and deepen the specific expertise we have crop by crop, landscape by landscape, issue by issue, but that we are able to work increasingly together. Now, I know that both ILRI and ICRAF and the others here, Biodiversity and uh, SEAT, and uh, I'm going to forget everybody's, uh, but you know who you are. I know that we have examples of fantastic sort of intra-center and inter-center collaboration. Um, but I know that that is not always the norm. And I think that one of the things that we will be discussing between the director generals of the centers and the fund council is what are the ways in which the fund council can support the consortium board and the director generals to make that more the norm. So are we, are we managing to um, capitalize on the opportunities for interdisciplinary research between centers and for a CGIR approach? As you know, there is enormous pressure on uh, resources for aid, assistance, development. Uh, this pressure is not going to go away. Uh, the economic situation facing the traditional donors in Europe, North America, Australasia, is not going to ease in the next few years, and spending priorities will be hard fought. And so one of the other preoccupations I have as the chair of the Fund Council is not only maintaining the commitment level of the traditional donors of CGIR, being able to extract you know, as much bang for the buck uh, as we can, and that's where your role comes in very importantly, communicating what you get for your investment in agricultural research, which I think is well known within the sort of cognoscenti of agricultural research, but isn't necessarily known more broadly. Uh, part of my job is to communicate that as well. So, how do we maintain the traditional donors at the levels that they are at, or perhaps increase? And then where do we go for future sources of funding? And, and that is, I think, from different public sources, but it's also about private-public collaboration. Now, we need to preserve the public good uh, ethos of CGIR, but our collaboration with the private sector is going to determine how we are able to successfully leverage our work and successfully fund our work going forward. Uh, and so I, I'm very much looking forward to working with the director generals, with the other funders on, you know, how do we do this so that we preserve everything which has made CGIR such a success over the last 41 years, but at the same time positions us to go to the next level. Um, so um, no particular wisdom from me. I'm kind of daunted by talking to such a quality audience. Um, you know, I, uh, I come to your area of work as an enthusiast, but not as an expert. Uh, I'm not quite sure what my expertise is, um, frankly, but uh, you know, I now sit behind a desk most of the time. Uh, but my, my job is to promote you, uh, communicate what you do uh, individually and as a whole, and to make the CGIR network um, a fundamental, keep it as a fundamental component of the struggle for food security, for sustainability, 
um, for an ability to have a more greener and more inclusive growth across the world over the next 20 years. Rio Plus 20 offers us, I think, um, an opportunity to press what I call a reset button for sustainable development. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit the developed world, Jeff Immelt, who was then the head of, uh, is the head of uh, General Electric, said that he hoped that the crisis would be a reset button, uh, that the world could hit a reset button on the financial world and how financing works. Um, that didn't really happen. People sort of played at the edges of reform in the financial world. But I think that Rio offers us an opportunity to sort of hit a button in terms of the way we talk about sustainable development. The phrase sustainable development has never really been defined in an operational sense over the last 20 years. It was defined by Grohal and Brundtland in 1987. And I think we all have an operational sense of what it means in our hearts and our minds. But in some ways, it's sort of become a stumbling block because it can mean everything to everybody. The next 20 years of sustainable development mean providing policymakers with the tools, the data, and the evidence to be able to make some very tough choices. Because letting everybody have everything is not working for everybody. And the path to sustainable development is under threat. So we in the World Bank Group are very focused on the different pathways of growth that are greener, but that will provide for everybody. And that is going to mean that there will be tough choices to be made if you're a low-income country, tough choices to be made as a middle-income country, and tough choices to be made as a developed economy, which is flat in growth with an aging population. So this is about um, rapid growth, which is sustainable for low-income countries. It's about shrinking the footprint in the growth that middle-income countries are enjoying with fast-growing low-income countries like Kenya. Uh, and then it's also about the efficiency that needs to be developed in economic systems in the developed world. The big part of that, underlying all, all of that, is our ability to um, work with water, energy, and food in conjunction. A big part of that is your work. So I hope that in your labs on a day-to-day -day basis, you can see how your individual work is important in its own right, but is a component part of a much bigger tapestry of the data and evidence that we need in order to shift the direction in which the world's growth patterns are, are, are moving. Uh, my job is to sort of come here and tell you, you do matter and you do fit into that, but also just by being here, I already have like three or four different stories in my head that I can use when I'm talking to donors and to partners about why centers like this, like Ilri, like all of you here and across Africa, uh, across the world, are so important for, for what we do. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much once again. Um, and I and the rest of the donors would like to say thank you. And uh, we hope that the partnership will flourish and go from strength to strength. Thanks very much, Rachel. And um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention to start with, I, I didn't introduce Jimmy Smith, who is the new Director General for the International Life Education Institute, Hillary, also based in Nairobi. Um, Kenya is the only country in the world that is blessed with two... Kenya is the only country in the world that is blessed with two CGR centers. And Jim, I don't know if you want to say a word of welcome or a couple of words to the staff or go straight to questions. Well, brief word, because I'd like to hear the questions. I'm delighted to be here um, as part of the CGIR, but particularly here in Nairobi, where we have such a richness of centers, not just ICRAF and Hillary, but so many others. As Rachel said, um, I've come from being a researcher in the CGIR to being a bilateral donor, a multilateral donor in the World Bank, and then back to the CGIR. Closer, synergistic cooperation is at my heart. So this is exactly the message I would have liked to hear. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I look forward to working with all of you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, Rachel. Thank you to Jimmy and Tony for also setting the stage for us. And welcome everyone to the town hall meeting. We're going to take about another <coughs> 18 minutes and see how much we can get done. Rachel, I'd like to pose a couple of questions that came in ahead of time to you. 
Um, I saw a lot of nodding of heads at a number of the points you were making. So there's a lot of agreement in the room. And so first I'd like to ask two interrelated questions. I know from your history you are big on impact and big on impact at the, um, at the level of the poor. So one question is, we need more partners to do more effective research, but there's little new funding available to engage them. How might we change the partnership leverage model? And then alongside that, I'd like to ask a question about your views on how the Independent Science and Partnership Council under the Fund Council are going to be measuring quality of research. So just really easy questions. <laughs> can, we, can I go now? No. Okay. Um, I, I think I've got this one. Yeah, um, this one I can just switch off and just go. No, no, no. Um, so, well, very good question. First of all, on, um, I, I agree that um, I don't know about more partners, uh, but I do agree that you know, almost everything has to be done in partnership these days. And I think there may be different partners that we haven't quite worked out how to work with them. I was very interested in, in the labs that I've just been in, you know, sort of the collaboration with, with Unilever, you know, so Unilever, other donors, uh, you know, and centers working together. And I, I think that that's, that's the um, way of the future. I mean, in terms of the kinds of resources we're raising at the moment, we've raised, uh, in 2011, we raised just over $700 million. Uh, we're sort of 300 million shy of that billion dollar target. And I've, um, I've you know, set up the target of reaching that additional 300 million, uh, trying to bring the issue to the fore in the G8 meeting, which will take place in Chicago uh, later this year. And, you know, we've suggested uh, to the United States that if they want some quick wins, because, you know, people who host G8s and G20s always want a quick win, that putting another $300 million into CGIR would be one of your quickest wins. Um, so I, I think the money is, is, is coming um, at, the, at the sort of consortium level. Um, you know, I think that my, my attitude is, and I don't know enough, uh, but that to maintain that kind of funding level, a billion, I mean, that was ambitious. We're nearly there. Um, and it's quite extraordinary, actually, because there are very few issues in the world where they, they hit the uh, headlines, and food security hit the headlines in 2008, right? So we're, we're riding the food security tiger. And then food security stayed, unfortunately, from the perspective of the poor, but fortunately in terms of our ability to mobilize, has stayed in the headlines since 2008. <clears throat> that very rarely happens. You know, issues come up, they peak, and then they drop off for 20 years, and then they come back, you know. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a, a moment which we cannot, you know, waste. Um, and so uh, being able to uh, package the work, package the partnership, the opportunity, what would happen, you know, like, what would likely happen, the, ap the application of the ideas that you have, of the work that you might do. So I know that, in, you know, in Ilri, you know, you're getting funding for, you know, the impact of livestock on climate change or climate change on livestock, you know. so. You know, I think that the, the way in which you, you, you position and package what you do you know, plays to very different audiences in very diff with different concerns. And so we just have to get, I think, a lot, a lot better at that. Um, but yes, I, I agree that uh, I need to do some more thinking about how we position some of the partnerships and how we help individual centers. Um, I, you know, obviously, as the Fund Council, I also have views about um, uh, you know, sort of the family dynamic of CGIR. Um, you know, um, families, um, you know, are difficult sometimes, and it's, it's dysfunctional. Um, you said it, I wasn't going to say it. Um, and, you know, you, you're sitting at the Sunday, you know, the Sunday lunch table, and you, you know, think, you know, I'd really rather not be here, you know, I'd like to go and just go back to my apartment and cook my own omelette. And, you know, that works, but then after you've had an omelette every day for five days, you're lonely and you're sick of omelettes and you really want to come back and have that family lunch. Um, and so, you know, I think from a fund council perspective, we're very interested in family lunches because we think we can feed more people that way. I hope you understand my analogy. So um, I'll leave it at that. On the Independent Science Council, um, 
<clears throat> I'm just get, I'm just really getting my arms around the relationship between the fun, fun council, the consortium board, and the science council. I know I have heard from many of your colleagues in other centres and from other director generals that there is a concern that the science council needs to be able to, um, you know, truly add value in its review of your work, and that if it is too generalist, there is a feeling that you know it's some kind of this disembodied um, uh, entity which is opining on your work without some of the uh, some of the expertise that you have. Um, I think I, that I hear you. I also think that that's uh, often part of the process when we what process when you come to that kind of peer review. Um, so that's something I will sort of bear in mind. But from the Fund Council perspective, I'm intrigued as to what the Fund Council wants to do with the scientific, uh, with the scientific, with the Science Council. Uh, I do believe that if we have a Science Council, then we should be um, that, we, that we should be listening to it. If we're going to listen to it, then it needs to be of sufficient quality to make sure that its advice is pertinent. Um, and I think, that, I think that we're in a sort of betwixt and between uh, mode at the moment where it is offering uh, an opinion, uh, but that opinion is sort of being noted, but not necessarily uh, informing the discussion in the fund council. So I've only been to one fund council. I was not the chair of the fund council at that meeting. I was observing it. Um, but these are the things that I will explore. Um, but I think that as a consortium, uh, the fund council uh, you know, should have the right to, to, to ask an independent science council about the quality of what we're receiving. Um, you know, exactly how we strengthen that mechanism is something that I will look at going forward. The final thing I would say is that I have read all of the CRPs. Uh, they are of vastly varying quality, um, which is okay, up to a point. Um, the other point that I would say is that I don't expect it, it, at the beginning of a CRP for you to be able to say you know, this is the impact that we're going to have. I don't expect to have a fully built out sort of log frame with every box filled in. But I do think that the clarity of purpose and thought at the beginning of a CRP matters. And the, what, the CRPs which I found the easiest to sort of promote, to um, sell as it were, are the ones where you can see um, the trajectory of what may happen as a result of collaborative research. Um, and I think that in this day and age where funding is under pressure, I, I think you have a responsibility to be able to articulate at least that. Um, so I think if people ask you to cross T's and dots I's, dot I's in terms of you know, what, what's going to happen five years down the road, I think you have the right to push back and say this is, uh, this is an, a process with integrity and we can't tell you all of that. But I do think you need to be able to um, uh, describe scale of ambition and describe this clarity of thought and purpose that you're putting into a collaborative program at the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, you've given us a very good segue into the next two questions. Um, we understand that you very much have your eyes on this target of this much promised $1 billion. Um, we'd be very keen to hear when you think that might come through. And, and with that, if you would look forward three to four years and say, how do you anticipate that those funds would be invested in window one into the fund or window two into the CRPs? Um, well, first of all, um, I'm not going to tell you when I think the billion, I mean, I mean I'm, you know, I'm not an agricultural researcher, but I'm also not stupid. So, I, I mean, I'm <coughs> so thank you for the question, but you know, I'm not answering uh, soon, hopefully. Um, but, but seriously, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we, you know, the World Bank Group puts 50, um, 50 million dollars in uh, annually. Um, you know, and that's that's uh, it's not an easy thing to do uh, because it's a, it's a grant, and you know, we're and we're a bank. So we don't like giving out grants. Um, it depletes our capital. Um, and you know, under the leadership of Bob Zellick, it's been easier to give 50 million to CGIR than I think uh, for many other things that have to be fought over. You know, but every year it's a debate and it's a discussion. 
I, I think that the, you know, I see a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of goodwill in this area and the commitment, the global commitment to food security is, uh, is, is profound. And so I, I am optimistic, but I, I think that we, we can't rest on our laurels. And uh, there, there is a real responsibility to be, to be able to show how that um, 700 million today, but or that billion, you know, what, it, what it leverages. Um, because it's not, it's, it's not the story of the 700 million, it's the seven, what the 700 million then leverages from everybody else. You know, the, if you could put a price tag on, for example, the Unilever partnership, what is Unilever putting in? Okay, so you're giving the CGIR a dollar, but CGIR through the centers and individual research programs is taking that dollar and making it into 10. You have to be able to tell that story today because uh, that's uh, un under pressure. Um, on window one, window uh, two, um, you know, it's not really what I think. It's what the funders think. And what I am struck by is that part of the reform was to be able to get to, to generate long-term funding uh, for, for the, for the, for the um, for, for CGIR. And it's interesting that that's actually proving difficult um, because many of the donors fund agricultural research from a sort of protective pot of, of, of money for ag research which is, you know, from another pot which is dispersable on a yearly basis. And for a lot of the donors to give multi-year tranches of money means that they have to either get signature at a higher level or they have to get ministerial sign-off um, or it has to come from a different pot of money. And clearly the people who are committed to CGIR are nervous about sort of taking this protected area of, of, of funding that they can give on an annual basis to CGIR to take that into a wider sort of fist fight within any donor agency about where the priorities are going to be. So I think we are betwixt and between. And uh, my, my principal focus is on really understanding why the donors who were part of the reform process because they wanted to be able to put it on a multi-year platform, can't actually deliver on that multi-year platform. And there are, there are going to have to be solutions. I don't know what they are yet, um, but they're, they're, they're fundamentally important. So, sorry, I didn't answer either question. No, fantastic. We really appreciate your accommodating those. Um, at this moment, I'd like to open it up to the floor for a couple, <coughs> two questions. And I ask you to be as brief as you are brilliant in your query, so we have time for a response. And also, you will have noticed green cards in your seats. Please, if you have a comment or an additional query um, for Rachel, please write those down and leave them in your seat, because I know she'd like to hear, because we don't have the time to hear more about the issues and ideas you have. Two questions? Anybody available? Um, and please, for Frank, please, please introduce yourself. Hi, Rachel. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Frank Place. I work here at ICRAF on the Impact Assessment Unit. Um, my question is for you wearing your other hat as Vice President at the World Bank. And I, over the years, have felt that one of the missed opportunities of the CG is actually getting more integrated into the other World Bank programs that are billions and billions of dollars. And I think if we could um, align ourselves a bit better with some of those programs uh, in a co-learning co mode, it would um, you know, be to, to the advantage of both of us. And so my question is whether you think that's a possibility, something we should strive to improve, and how, uh, excuse me, how that can be done. Thanks. Great question. Thank you very much. Is there a second question before she answers? Please, Ernest. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ernest Gatoro in finance. Uh, I think... Uh, with the, with the with reform program uh, where the reduction of unrestricted funding flowing into the center has put most of the centers in a challenging position of actually being able to meet uh, the full costing of their research work. And I think uh, for 2011, we are lucky that uh, the, the consortium office and the fund council was able to provide some stability funding. Now, as we move into the years, I think, the biggest challenge is for the centers to be able to actually fully cost their projects. And the biggest problem we have is that most of the donors are not willing to accept full costing of projects. Now, if your hat is the, in the fund council chair, what 
uh, what strategy do we have to actually encourage the donors to accept full costing of projects so that the centers can be sustainably uh, run efficiently? Thank you very much. Rachel, we'll invite you to answer those. Thank you. I'll, I'll answer both questions and just say one word in conclusion. Um, so I, it's, it's funny you should ask that question because we've been talking about that in the bank. And actually, Nathan uh, Delita here, who is the sector lead for sustainable development in the Nairobi office, um, we were, t we were talking about it in the car, actually, on the way here. I, I think that um, there's a responsibility on both sides. Um, so the responsibility on the bank side is that our task team leaders, our management, especially in the field, um, you know, is able to sit back and think holistically about the partnerships and the interlinkages uh, necessary in order to a pursue the work and then to promote the work and to sort of develop our work. Um, and I think that often, you know, task team leaders are just sort of like running, 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 and they don't have time to sort of think, look up, and, and just connect. And I think that I have something to do with the management of the agricultural rural development department in particular, but also with our colleagues in the forest work, etc. To 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 you know to sort of in our in our own mindset, you know, leverage CGIR much more than we do. And this is something we've been talking about, and I think we can do it. I think you have a responsibility as well. I mean, I, I really loved your description of the World Bank as having billions and billions of dollars. Um, <clears throat> you know, at one level, that's true. On, on another level, uh, you can imagine that it's not. And I, I think that what I hear, both from colleagues in the centres, from colleagues in the world of the centres, and uh, from colleagues in the bank, is that too often the conversation is, oh, hello, you know, we're from a centre and we need money. And, you know, that isn't the way you, um, you know, you don't ask a woman out on a date that way, right? You don't, you don't ask a guy out. <laughs> And I, you know, if you're going to build a partnership, that's not the first thing that you say. So I think that, I think that, uh, I think we, we've got a lot of work to do on the bank side, but I think that the, the you know, an orientation around what partnership means as well. Uh, now there are examples where this is working beautifully, and I think the other thing to do is to take those examples and hold them up and say, look at how we manage to work together as partners here. I think it's easier for people to replicate things that work than to just sit and listen to things that don't work. Uh, the second point, um, yes, uh, I, I understand the transition has been difficult, and I'm looking at the clock. Um, I think that um, I think that donors are are interested in the sustainability of the centres. I think donors understand the full costs, but I think that frankly, donors are going to want to see much more detail, and uh, on a on a on a specific basis uh, around, the, um, around the overheads and the, um, the actual sort of carrying costs of, the, of some of the centers. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, and I think that, you know, it, gone are the days where it's like, you know, give me the money and I'll manage it the way I want to manage it. I mean, no, uh, that's not how you run businesses and that's not the way the donors think anymore. And so I think that there is um, a transition um, I think that the whole purpose of the reform is that you should be able to get sustaining financing, but I think that you need to have an eagle eye on efficiency and effectiveness, and you need to at least be able to explain uh, the efficiency of your current setup and why you're happy with it. I see huge areas for efficiency, um, but it's not my job as the chair of the fund council to push that through. It is my job to ask questions of the consortium board and ask pointed questions of the Director Generals about whether or not we're actually achieving maximum efficiency. And I'm not using efficiency as a code for something else. So I'm not talking about merger or, or, or these things which, which get mentioned. Maybe down the line, that's something you choose to do. But I'm just urging that we drive every efficiency we can through the system in order to justify the billion dollars and the leverage of the billion dollars. So I understand it's a difficult transition, but you know, uh, we'll work with you on understanding that. But monitoring and evaluation, being able to tell the story of your bottom line, you know, driving your costs down, this is what everybody has to do today. And so I just wanted to say thank you to Biversity, to C4, CIMIT, ICRASAT, SEAT, as well as ILRI and ICRAF, so I remembered who you all were. Um, and I hope that I, we can do this every time that I come through Nairobi. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel, and, and for reserving so much of your time. Uh, Rachel is on a whistle-stop tour of East Africa and is, and is on a field assignment now to, to dash out and look at some energy projects, but we're extremely grateful that you took the chance to, to drop in and meet the centres to be able to articulate and tell our stories for us. This is the very first CG community she has been to see in the field. So all of the centres based here in Nairobi, we're privileged that we're the, the first experience for her. Um, and Ernest mentioned our budget cuts and budget uh, difficulties, and so we, we'd love to give you a very expensive gift. Um, however, we are looking at efficiencies, and therefore, we, not an expensive gift, but a very special gift. So we asked Catherine Mathuri to come forward and to present to you a book on gender analysis uh, in Africa. And um, we'd ask the ICRAF Ladies Choir to uh, assist in presentation of this. <laughs> running, running, running. So could the ladies ululate, please? Come forward for the photo call, please. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>